Welcome to the Radical CEO, transformation stories from the C-suite with your host, Libby Gill. Libby started her career in Hollywood where she led communications at media giants Sony, Universal, and Turner Broadcasting. Now, as a human engineering expert, she leads leadership, coaching, and consulting firm Libby Gill & Company, where she guides Fortune 500 clients to lead through change, challenge, and chaos. An international speaker and award-winning author, Libby's mission with this videocast is to bring you intimate conversations with business and thought leaders who've transformed careers and companies with their radical ideas and bold actions. Hey, everybody, I've got a really cool guest today who comes from the world of baseball and uses professional sports as a foundation in his business. But what I find really interesting is that just like me, he had one of those major aha moments when he knew it was time to leave a job and even a profession that he'd loved for years. Skip Weissman worked with five baseball franchises, the Boston Red Sox, Cincinnati Reds, the New York Mets, the Seattle Mariners, and Tampa Bay Rays, and the Texas Rangers, starting when he was only 26 years old. Now, he didn't work for my team, the Dodgers. They were not in his lineup, but I forgive him for that since he's an East Coaster. Skip has learned some really important leadership lessons, some very hard ones, just like me in the entertainment world, that he shares now in his consulting business, Your Championship Company, and he speaks across the country talking about something that is really fascinating. And he's begun teaching companies this technique called open book management that I think is really revolutionary. And quite frankly, I had never heard of it until Skip taught me what that was. And I don't use that word revolutionary very lightly. It truly is company changing, which he'll tell us about. So welcome, Skip Weissman. Thank you. Great to be here, Libby. Uh, Thank you also for that wonderful introduction. Well, it all happens to be true, Skip, because I know you and your work. But tell us how your, your baseball career, how that all began and what got you down that path, which seems like every guy's dream. Yeah, well, you know, just like many, I wouldn't say everybody, but many uh, young boys in America, my dream at seven years old after going to my first Major League Baseball game in New York, a Mets game, was to be a ball player. Um, unfortunately, about six years later, when I went out for my junior, uh, junior high school, ninth grade baseball team, I got cut and realized that you know, uh, I probably was not going to be the next first baseman for the New York Mets, which was my dream. Now, I did come back and make the team as a, a in senior high, uh, but I was not your superstar ball player in high school. I hit 220 in high school, which was a low level uh, batter. And uh, so I knew I wasn't going anywhere. I was a no hit, decent fielding first baseman that was slow. Couldn't run, so I had, I had very few tal- uh, abilities. So your, your dream was basically crushed right there. Maybe it's good that, uh, well, you know, I, I was an actress and didn't get very far and decided, well, okay, same yeah. thing, very competitive. Uh, after spending 20 years in baseball and seeing the lifestyle of a professional athlete, especially where I was at the, the lower to mid-levels of the minor leagues, uh, I missed out that I didn't do that. I, it's not a lifestyle I would have wanted. Some of the, I mean, if you make it, it's great, right? Just like if you became Meryl Streep or whatever, it's great, right? But how many of Meryl Streep's are there or, or Reese Witherspoon's or whatever, right? So Even working professional ball players or actors. I mean, that's like 0. 0.0 something percent. Yeah, so chances are I wasn't going to make it even if I was drafted. I've seen guys come through and I was listening to a podcast, I think it was an NPR story or something, or Planet Money or whatever, and they actually interviewed some former professional athletes who didn't make it, you know, and, you know, especially in in baseball, if you're drafted early out of high school, you go sign a pro contract, you may get a little bit of a signing bonus, but you never go to college, Mm -hmm. and you bounce around the minor leagues for six, eight years, and you get out when you're 26, 28 years old, it's too late to go back to college, sort of. You don't have no money to go back to college. because, And it's, what do you do? And so I, I've seen it, and it, it's, you know, it, it's really a tough lifestyle. Um, so if you've if you got the talent, I say go for it. 
give it a couple of years. But if you're not moving up, you know, by the time you're 20, 21, it's time to move on and change lanes. Right. Um, and there, there was a couple of guys who um, came through my teams who were really smart kids who, you know, they went to Stanford, they played ball at Stanford, they or they played ball at Harvard or whatever, and they do the minor league thing for a year or two, and they said, uh, I'm just, <laughs> this is a hard way to make a living, I'm going to do something else. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, some get it, but uh, yeah, so I, I realized at an early age, I had to do something else for my life, but I wanted to keep it in sports. Well, you had a very particular moment when you had that, oh, it's time to do something else, and it wasn't your high school a baseball team, but it was later after you had been a professional for many years. Yeah, so I'm in baseball for 17 years. Uh, I had reached sort of the top of the, the profession as to where I wanted to get to because the next move would have been an environment I didn't want to work in. So I was at the top of my game uh, and there was sort of nowhere else to go. And I could have stayed where I was for as long as I wanted to. I had an owner that I worked with who actually gave me equity in the franchise. So I was a 10% owner of the team. Um, very loyal guy. I could have worked for him forever. Yep. Um, but I started to really start getting a little bit bored uh, just hanging around. And so there was one night at the ballpark, mid, mid-July, mid mid-season. Uh, we have a home game. It's the sixth inning of the game. And there was an area of the stadium where I would sort of perch in the middle innings of the game to watch the game. And I could see the whole stadium. And you know, we'd chit chat and everything as we were watching the ball game. And then um, I looked at the scoreboard and we were losing four to two. It's the bottom of the sixth inning. It was like nine o'clock at night. And I looked back at the scoreboard and I realized, you know, I don't care if we win or lose. I just want to go home. Yeah, that, that's a pretty good indication. You know, I was going to be there till midnight. We had another home game the next day. I'd be back at the stadium at 9 or 9.30 in the morning after getting home at midnight or 1 a.m. And I just said, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. It's no longer fun. And But that was a real awakening because, you know, I, that's all I had known. It's all I cared to do. It's all I wanted to do. And I was really in a good community. So any other move would have been outside to a new home and a new move and my uh, starting just, over. I, what can I do? I said I wasn't I wasn't professionally ready, personally ready, or financially ready. Ha. But I figured it's like you're yeah. getting shoved off the ledge. Skip, I had no idea how similar that was to my situation where I'd worked in television. Huh. I was, I was head of media relations and communications at Universal after Sony and Turner. I'd been there about 16 years, same length as you. And I remember I, I launched, I started with Married with Children, launched that show, ended with Dr. Phil. But at one point, I went and laid down on a friend's couch at the studio in her office and said, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do it anymore. I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's not this. Yeah. And that was the day I started sort of plotting what's next. And as you know, it yeah. takes a while. So yeah. what did you do when you made that, okay, this is no fun. I got to move on. So I looked at the fact that this is my 17th year. And most, a lot of careers, teacher, you know, firefighter, police, military, 20 years is a year they usually retire, right? And they move on to something yeah. else. So I figured, well, I don't have the retirement plans or the pensions that those careers have. Right. But 20 years is a good round number to go off on. It's, it's better cache than 18, right? So I said, I got two and a half years to figure this thing out. And I really went on some soul searching. I did a lot of personal development programs, chased Tony Robbins around for a little while, and, you know, came to the conclusion that I my skills that I use to build a small business, which is what a minor league baseball team is, just your regular small business, just in a unique in, uh, industry, were transferable. And I was pretty successful uh, work environment because just so people know, I, I had nothing to do with the player personnel. I was the local business manager, say, and the, the major league affiliates gave us our players, and we just said thank you for the team. And, uh, and so we ran the local business operation. So you set up everything around the game in terms of ticket sales and bringing people in and sponsors and all that stuff. I put butts in seats, kept the beer cold and the bathrooms clean. That was my job. <laughs> right. And, uh, 
And so that was transferable. You know, I, I figured I could work with other small businesses to help them create a work environment that got results where people were happy working in um, and collaborating, you know, high collaborative work environments. And so that's, that's what I, that's what I did. I, I said, let me, let me try and do this. And locally, I had a pretty good head start because I was sort of a big fish in a small pond. Uh, I brought the team to town in 1994. We were really big back then because we, we built a new stadium, a lot of political wrangling over funding the ballpark. So we were in the news every day. It's one of those things where there's no, you know, any news is good news, right? No matter how bad it is or people bashing you. You're on the front page of the newspaper every day. Yeah, and you we, could probably talk to anybody in town, right? Yeah. We, we couldn't sell stuff fast enough. We couldn't sell sponsorships and billboards and signage and tickets. Uh, we, I came to baseball heaven here. Um, and so I was a local celebrity. And I had a lot of business contacts just from the baseball thing. So I said, let me just start fresh right here. And that's, that's what I did. So had you done any personal development? I mean, I remember the first time I, I knew of it forever, but the first time I actually took a class, it was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Do I belong here? I was, well, uh, at about the same time, I was also going through divorce. So that'll wake you up. Yeah. So all of this stuff was happening at the same time. Uh, I can't remember exactly what came first, the chicken or the egg, <laughs> which yeah. of those. Um, but then a flyer from Anthony Robbins showed up in my inbox and he was coming to New Jersey. And I said, what do I have to lose? Let me go spend a weekend with Tony. This was 1998. And that started my, but that was really my, you talk about, you know, you asked me about professional development. That was probably the first ever professional development experience it, I had. It goes to that when the student is ready, the teacher appears, boy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It was like, you know, it was like really weird. So that, that started the transformation. And, you know, and people have different feelings about Tony and the way he does his business and everything. Uh, but I can tell you, I was a person who needed that at that time. Yeah. And he gave me, going through his program, which I did pretty extensively for two years, go out on my own and, and, and do something different. And so, yeah. Wow. So cut to today and what you're doing. Because you've now been in business for yourself with the your championship company, your consulting firm, for a while. Yeah, the scary thing is it's coming up on 18 years since I've left baseball. Wow. I was in yeah. baseball eight, uh, 20 years. So yeah. now it's like that. This is <laughs> eerie, Skip, because I also got divorced around this time. The <laughs> same year I started my company, and I'm now 19 years in. <laughs> That, so. yeah, that, that's, that's, that's really serendipitous or something. That's really weird. Uh, but yeah, so uh, it's been 18 years now, which is hard to believe. But, yeah. uh, I know I don't look that old, but uh, I started when I was very young. Um, so, so what yeah. kind of clients are you working with? And what do you find that, and I mentioned already the uh, open book management, which I think is it's sort of mind blowing that companies will do this and you've had some great results. It, it, it takes the right business owner. Yeah, I mean, it, oh, it, explain it, what it is for those who, who've never yeah. heard of that. So open book management is financial transparency. So everybody talks about the books, right? What are the books in business? Books are the financials, right? Are we making money? What's the P and L profit and loss statement, income statement? What's the balance sheet look like, which you know, speaks to the cash and the debt and, and assets and liabilities. Um, so it's all those things, the books, that are tucked into a drawer here that nobody right. gets to see, and they're lo under lock and key. Uh, oftentimes the CEO doesn't even really understand them, and then we leave that to the CFO right. to come in with all the paperwork and hand out stuff or put something on a chart. And, the, the annual presentation, right. So, uh, and that usually presentation is just a very, very small inner circle of people, right? Mm -hmm. The receptionist of the company doesn't see that, right? Mm -hmm. The janitor doesn't see any of that. They don't need to see it in theory. Uh, and so open book management is the concept where you share the financials with employees. 
uh, on a regular basis. It's not just a one time, once a year thing. Hey, folks, this is how we did. You're not going to raise this year here. Look at the numbers. <laughs> right? This is why. And yeah. okay, whatever you say is because they don't know what they're looking at. Right. Um, but it's it's done in a way that people understand it and they get it. And the next level is they will actually begin to get involved in how can we move some of these numbers. So it's set up in a way that employees actually understand how to move the numbers and influence and impact the numbers so that if they see a profit of 10% based on top line sales, which equals say $250,000, they're going to start asking questions. Well, how can we make it 300,000? Right? And we'll look at line items on the P&L that frontline employees can influence. And the, and the reason why they start asking these questions is because there's a transparent, uh, systematic bonus program that they participate in. And parents key, because I, one of the things that really attracted me to this was the end of my baseball career uh, with, the, with the last team I was with. Uh, we were doing extremely well. As I said, we couldn't sell stuff fast enough, right? Ticket, we sold out every game for like five years. Crazy. So at the end of the year, we had a nice profit left over at the end of the year, and we gave out some really nice, sexy bonuses. I mean, we're talking, somebody's making $30,000 a year, they're getting a $5,000 bonus a year. That's after. meaningful. Yeah. Uh, except next year, maybe it's 4500 Yeah. And they're disappointed. And I can't explain why. We just didn't have as good a year. Mm-hmm. That's a hard conversation to have. I bet. You know, because you think that your people's going to be appreciative, uh, but they're disappointed, right? Because it wasn't as much as last year, and you start mm-hmm. thinking it's always going to be that way. So when I saw this concept, I said everything is transparent. All the board, which is the financial P and L forecast for the year, um, we also project the bonus pro- program. Right. So, you know, on day one, if we reach this benchmark, you get this percent bonus, that everybody gets the same bonus, right? And so now everybody's working together to moving that bonus level up. Right. It's, it's a really tremendous program. So the two things you have to be aware of with this is, one, there's open book management where it's financial transparency, and a lot of companies do financial transparency. Mm-hmm. Um, even, you know, uh, you know, stock exchange, you know, publicly traded Public companies, companies. Yeah. right? And they've got, nobody understands them. But they have to, right? I mean, they've got to do it. Right. They're published, right? And if yeah. you want to look at them and plow through it, you can do it. Um, employee stock ownership companies, what's called ESOPs, right? There's yeah. some companies that are employee owned. They have to have financial transparency. But even those companies do the second part of it. And the second I- part... Oh, is when you start to make the changes necessary to drive up profits? Yes. And to do that, you have to have financial literacy. Yeah. So what I do in my work is I bridge that gap. We're going to do financial transparency. And you, you, Ms. Business Owner, Ms. Gill, is going to have to be open to sharing the numbers and understanding them. Um, but you also want to train your employees and teach them financial literacy so they know what what it is so that every dollar that comes into your company doesn't go into your pocket. Right. <laughs> Everybody yeah. thinks we make a $10,000 sale. That's just going in, in, in the owner's pocket. No, maybe $500 is going in the owner's right. pocket. Yeah, that's know. about right. Yeah. They yeah. don't understand that. And so we teach them profit margin, understand differences. Um, and then they get it. And I usually one of the first things I'll do is we'll get the employees together in various meetings, depending on how big the company is. We might do it in one big meeting or break it down. But we'll ask the employees, so for every dollar that comes in to the company, how much goes to the bottom line profit that the owner can take home? And a lot of people will say anywhere from 30, 40, 50, 60%. One would wish, right? Yeah. And, and what is it generally? It's... Like- Four to eight percent, probably. Okay. So I did this with a manufacturing company recently, and one of the oldest employees in the company is about sixty-five years old. He's been a machinist for thirty some odd years with the company. Went through three ownership changes. Really good guy, very loyal, loves the company. And we showed him. I think it was like five and a half percent. Bottom line. 
And he said, we were <laughs> on the dollar. And he was amazed. Yeah. And, you know, he's also one of the people who always complains about his salary and how much he's making. His raise is never enough. Uh, but then he understood why things are the way they are. And we started to change the conversation. Yeah. And that's really empowering. So do people who do, can't or feel like they can't affect the bottom line, they're not in sales, they're not bringing revenue in, what is it like for them? Do they, can they have a part in this as well? Absolutely, they do. So good example is a manufacturing group, this machinist. Right. So think about this. When I talk about this, it changes the conversation, it changes the dialogue in the, uh, in the company. When we started to unveil this concept, and the owner would go around into the machine shop and, you know, just work on stuff and have little conversations with people. One day after hearing about this, this what can I do to drive sales? I don't have any impact on that. And so we began to start talking about this. Well, what if we could take some of our key products that there's competition in the marketplace for that we have to fight and, you know, uh, put bids in and try and win yes. bids. Sure. What if we could promise that we can get this product out the door delivered faster than anybody else. Right. Yeah. You're, you're involved in that. Right. Yeah. How fast you work, how efficient we are, how we can change our operation to be more efficient and effective. You and your teammates can drive that delivery. Mm -hmm. Right now it kind of gets out whenever it does. Sometimes we make delivery dates, sometimes we don't. But what if we made a commitment to, to this product that makes up a significant part of our revenue that in our industry, it's standard four to six week delivery that you're involved with, well, we could promise two week delivery. Yeah, and I imagine even the procurement guy or gal who's buying the, the pieces or the tools or the, the sheet metal or whatever it is, they get those, those vendor bids in, you know, instead of waiting a week and a half, get it in in three days. Yeah. Then you, you speed up the whole chain. Right. So now we have now we have frontline employees saying, well, maybe we should buy more product on the front end to have an inventory of products. So it's sitting for the order when it Ready. comes in instead of ordering as it comes in. Yeah. Who knows what the right answer is? Right. But we, but we change the conversation. We get those people discussing it. Um, and it's really empowering to people. It's really yeah, I, I think that's the word because it's not only the financial incentive, but they've got to feel really engaged in the, in the growth and the productivity. That to me is probably even more motivating than the money. Yeah. And, and I've seen this work a couple of times. Their value, they, they trust what's going on in the company now. They're right. just not in the, in the corner of the room just doing their thing. Um, and it also actually is, is, is fun for them because if you're a machinist and all you do is run this machine day after day after day, it gives you something else to, to work towards, to yeah. work on, to learn. Yeah. And it, it's really cool to see. Not everybody gets it. I'm not going to say this is, this is perfect. Right. Um, but historically, over time, what we see is if, if, as Gallup says, you know, employee engagement is 30% or whatever, yeah. right. you see 75 to 90% employee engagement in this program. Interesting. What, they're also learning a life skill that impacts their personal lives in a huge way. Yeah, it, it, it will flow into their personal life. Right. And sometimes some owners even are very uh, intentional about that. They will actually do some personal financial literacy training. Sure. Well, it just makes an all round employee that much, that much better. Um, yeah. Smarter, stronger. Yeah. So it's, it, I love it. Um, it goes back to again, the, the situation I had with my last team when I couldn't explain why the bonus wasn't what, uh, as good as it was last year or what we could have done differently to, to impact it. And I just came upon this concept, which was started in Springfield, Missouri in 1982-83 um, by a gentleman by the name of Jack Stack, who took over a company from International Harvester. It was going yeah. under and International Harvester was going to sell their division. And he was running this uh, factory that had 119 employees. And he saw the hand running on the wall. If we get sold, who knows We're what done. our future is. So he bought the company and they got an $8.9 million loan to buy a $9 million company. And he opened the books and said, this is it. We're all doing this together. Out of necessity. Yeah, right. Because at the time, first of all, you can't do an 89 to one equity right. to, to debt anymore. deal anymore. 
Now, this was 1983. Um, but it, he said, we have two numbers. One, we have to make payroll every month because we all want to get paid. Right. And we have to cover the bank note. Right. We have to make sure we have that much cash every month to survive. I can't do this alone. We all have to figure this out together. And so we open the books. Um, it's now a full employee stock ownership company that uh, the value has gone through the roof. It's actually more valuable on a per share basis than Berkshire Hathaway over the last 30 years. Wow. And, and what kind of, of boss or company does this not work for? Uh, it worked. It will work, I think, for any company who has an owner who's open to figuring it out. The, the best thing I've learned about doing this, for, and I've only been doing this specifically for the last five years or so, the first 13 years before I came upon this, this is all from a company called The Great Game of Business in Springfield, Missouri, yeah. um, mm -hmm. that I'm involved with, that created the system from Jack Stack's original uh, uh, machine shop uh, manufacturing company. Um, they have set up a system that's really flexible that almost any business model can adopt and as I call adopt and adapt mm -hmm. to your, your model. The one, the one biggest challenge that certain companies have with this that takes a little longer transition is a type of company that's really driven by uh, commission salespeople. You know, it has to be tweaked and adjusted and it's not going to be for everybody because that's how they're driven because we try not to uh, uh, have commission salespeople on this because it, it just, it, it skews the incentives. Yeah, right. Because they commission on what they sell. Yeah. Right. Not what and, the team does. And, yeah. Yeah. And what, not what the bottom line gross <laughs> margin is off yeah. what they sell or it doesn't, uh, it doesn't include everybody else. So you're just selling, you're making your thing, but what about the people who are delivering the product? Where is their participation in what you just sold? So, we, we will work with the organization over time to transition away from that, uh, but that takes time to restructure so, so that the, the salespeople are made whole and their, their income still stays at the level they need it to. Um, but you're gonna lose some salespeople just because that's, right. you know, and it's not, this process is not for everybody at significant portion. And the longer you're playing, you hire looking for that type of mindset employee. Yeah. So it'll, it'll transition over time. But it's very empowering and very exciting, actually, when it when it. I'll bet when work. it kicks in. So, were you a finance guy way back when you were running baseball franchises? No, but I had to know enough of our financials. Uh, I'm I'm always I was always big on budgets, uh, and so I would work with our CPA, uh, who was also our controller for a number of different teams in our group. Um, so I I had a basic understanding. Yeah. of the financials and, and how they work, but I'm no, I'm no CPA or cost accountant or anything, but you pick it up along, along the way. That's really fascinating, the incentive that it adds when people feel some control in the, in the mission and how it's shaped. Yeah, if somebody's going to show you what's in the checkbook and what's not, it's, that's, a, that's a lot of uh, candor. Yeah, and the other thing, just to, so, so if there's any business owners out there that are running away and signing off because they don't want to think about this, the foundational concept of this is that bonus program. It's not a profit sharing program. Right. It's, it's framed as a gain share program. And, ah. and the reason why we frame it that way is because we create a threshold of profitability level that must be secured before we pay it out. So it protects the downside of the company and it protects the business owner's interest so that we're going to, because we want to make sure there's money put away for a rainy day or if we need a capital investment, that's going to go in the, in the threshold. And then everything above the threshold is what gets shared, usually at 50-50. And the company is protected because we start out the conversation. With this, the main thing we want to do with this is we want to protect your job and have long-term viability for the company. Um, so what kind of companies do you work with? What are, what are your ideal clients, as they say? Yeah, so three three areas. One is uh, manufacturing. This this process started in manufacturing. It's a perfect model for Makes manufacturing. Sense. Yeah, um, I've done been really successful with HVAC type companies. Yeah, uh, and I say HVAC, but it's, you know plumbers. Uh, I work with fire extinguisher companies, um, heating, uh, cooler companies. Yeah, 
um, because they have teams on the field, you know, out in the field in trucks and everything. And then you have an admin customer service team back home. That, that model works really well. And I've also worked with insurance agencies, small independent insurance agencies. Those are the three main areas I've, I've worked in. You know, you have success with one and you get referred. So that's sort of what's gravitated towards me. Kind of broadens your, your client base. So Skip, I know you got a really cool giveaway for our listener viewers. Can you, can you describe it? For the folks who are intrigued by this mm-hmm. concept, what I'd like to offer people is the story behind it. Uh, Jack Stack, who started the company with International Harvester, with the sale of International Harvester to his division, um, wrote a book in the late 90s, I think. Just, uh, just uh, it was 25th anniversary, it was just a few years ago. 20th anniversary, it was a few years ago. Um, and he came out with 20th anniversary edition of the book. Uh, it's called The Great Game of Business, and it tells the, the story and explains how you do this. It's sort of like a primer overview of how this process works. Um, and it's a really great uh, story. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it really is like a story about the American dream and capitalism and, and how you can tap into the entrepreneurial mindset of, mm-hmm. of everyday people when you didn't think they cared or, or had it in them. Uh, so the giveaway is the audio book uh, of the 20th anniversary of the great game of business. Oh, and cool. So they can get that by going to my uh, the w- special webpage on my website, which is yourchampionshipcompany.com forward slash great game. And is that where people learn more about your speaking and your programs and your consulting? Yeah. Yeah. That's just one page off the website. And there's the, the menu for my speaking and the, the programs that I offer and speaking videos. And there's also a tab for some client case studies. Oh, that's cool. Uh, that yeah. are speaking to my clients that have gone through this. That, that, speak to their their success with it so we can see what they've done and how it's impacted their company very cool one last question for you and that is in this world of radical ideas or less than uh depending on who you're talking to what is your radical idea that you would like to see implemented in the world of business or just the world in general not to be redundant (laughs) but but, but this is it. Uh, yeah. This, as you, you know, said, it's, it seems like it's a radical idea. It, business owners have to think differently. But imagine if you had a group of employees who thought and acted and made decisions like they own the company. That's what mm-hmm. I hear people who come to me wish that their employees were like. They weren't just here just for a paycheck. Right. Um, and they understand that if I want to make more money, I have to bring more value to the company. Um, imagine a workforce, an entire workforce, and now you have everybody understanding how business works and they're bringing value. And it, so I think transparency is, is the key to all this. Yeah. You know, and you've got to bring your employees in to make partner with them uh, to lift everybody else up right. when you do it i think everybody will will rise uh, it'll stop that entitlement mentality because you're changing expectations and i think everybody wins I, it comes right back to leadership which is a choice and not a job title and this is people all acting like leaders i could see somebody who is the brand new hire that's in charge of the file room wow you make your coding system yeah. more efficient you make things easier to find you cut hours so it really could apply to anybody. Yeah. The, the other thing that they've found, especially our seed manufacturing industry, which is still thriving and going strong, um, it has created entrepreneurs from frontline employees. They have, and the reason why I said this, this the ESOP, employee stock ownership stock price, mm-hmm. is a better investment than Berkshire Hathaway. Um, they have spun off 62 other companies that came from employee ideas. Wow. And That's pretty staggering. And so they'll, you know, some employee on the front line has an idea to spin off a company. They'll take it to the, 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 to the culture committee, the ownership culture committee and the company, and they'll evaluate it and they'll fund it. Yeah, boy, that's what it's so, like. It's own little incubator. Yeah, it's, and so that's, that's what happens when you get people thinking and feeling and acting like business owners. And that's what this process will do. It's, it is a radical idea. It, it, it shouldn't be, but it is. Yeah. Uh, 
And if anybody's interested, there's a thing called the, the gathering of games. Probably seven, 800 people representing a couple hundred companies that are playing the game. It's a whole full conference, three-day um, conference. Where do you find it? Uh, you go to uh, great, greatgame.com, uh, and uh, there should be information about events. About events. It's, it's, okay. This year it's in Dallas. And Is it Great Game or The Great Game? Uh, great Game. Great Game. Greatgame.com. Okay. Oh, so, yeah. Very and, cool. Uh, yeah, so the, the conference is really cool. I was there for the first time last year, and you get practitioners telling their story and actually wow. doing trainings and seminars for best practices and, and, and stuff. It's really cool. Well, that was pretty darn radical, Skip. Thank you so Thank you. much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I look forward to continuing to spread the message of the Bobo journey. Bobo. Absolutely. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And we'll be back next week with more. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Radical CEO. We invite you to view the episode blog post at our website, libbygill.com forward slash podcast, to get links and access additional resources. Join us again next time for another episode of The Radical CEO. Radical CEO.